I'm just going to start the recording and then I uh, have great pleasure in introducing our speaker this evening, Chris Watts. Um, let me give a bit of an introduction. I probably won't do you justice, Chris, so apologies for that. But um, I've known Chris, I worked out, Chris, I think that first project that we worked on was uh, 2002. Yeah, so we must have, like we must have been yeah. children. <laughs> you must have been, yeah. yeah. So Chris, Chris has many years experience in the study of sustainable soil management systems. His career at Rothamsted Research has basically three distinct though overlapping strands. First of all, the use of engineering principles in the design, testing and evaluation of novel tillage and field traffic techniques. Secondly, the use of engineering soil and material science principles to develop measures of soil quality, which underpin sustainable and productive UK agriculture. And thirdly, integrating engineering, geotechnical and soil science techniques to study soil and root physical characteristics relevant to crop growth and soil environmental function. This includes the design of novel laboratory and field test equipment. As an agricultural engineer and soil physicist, Chris is well placed to understand the effects of agricultural management on sustainable soil functions and the practical ways of improving crop production and soil quality. Okay, well, thanks so much for that, Jane, and um, welcome to CELSO, the real home of uh, agricultural engineering research and education. Um, if I'd have known we were such a select group, you could have come around and we'd have shared a beer. Yeah. But, we could. Uh, anyway, here, um, I thought I'd talk about the history of a field. Uh, it's kind of like a Christmas lecture, so it's quite easy going, I think. So really it's a reflection of progress in agricultural science and technology over the last 200 years uh, and in a changing environment. The history of the field for a book and a reflection of agricultural science and technology over the last 200 years in a changing environment. Uh, and as well as me, I've, I've borrowed lots of uh, bits and pieces from other ex-colleagues of mine at uh, Rothamsted. So it's Paul Porton who ran the, uh, the long-term experiments for that's the last, uh, 30 or 40 years or so. Andy Gregory is now taking it over and Andy MacDonald and Margaret Glenn Denning who runs the Electronic Rothamsted Archive. So the form of this uh, talk will be uh, a bit of an introduction, a, a brief talk about the uh, experiment itself and the bit they never tell you uh, when you go to uh, Rothamsted is the uh, changing mechanization um, it's all right to talk about the Green Revolution, but uh, without engineers and mechanisation, it would have been a lot, uh, a lot more troublesome. And then we move to uh, talk about the sample archive and, ele and the electronic Rothamsted ar archive, and then a little bit on weather and climate change, and then uh, some sort of social stuff so, so that's occurred over the last 200 years, <clears throat> including war and peace, a bit of unemployment, women and children, heroes and villains. So, so in terms of introduction, uh, the field I'm choosing is obviously Broad Book, and it's the longest running scientific experiment in the world. And it was set up to uh, um, measure the effect of fertilizer on crops. And it's been going since 1843. And if you want to check that out, it actually appears in the Guinness Book of Records. And uh, so I've got this picture in, uh, is, uh, the Broadbolt field is right in the center of uh, Rothamsted Farm and uh, you'll kind of recognize the shape. It's a slightly wonky rectangle. Uh, and I think uh, you all know Rothamsted, but anyway, the top, top of the picture is uh, the, the south end of Harvenden. The top left-hand corner of your screen would be more or less junction nine on the M1. Um, and uh, and the top right hand corner is more or less a railway station. The road along the bottom is the road to Redbourne. So it's part of Rothamsted. Rothamsted Research is also the ag longest running agricultural um, research station in the world. And it says it provides cutting edge science innovation and for nearly 180 years, which I hope to show you a little bit today. So going back to, uh, well, the actual site of the field was uh, originally probably 
cultivated by the Romans. In fact, there's a Roman temple about 150 meters from uh, um, Broadbalk. But uh, coming to a more uh, recent date, uh, the manor was, uh, there was a manor there in 1624 and it's been modified somewhat since then. But um, interestingly, that's where the manor is on, the, on this map. Uh, and I have to say this map will make more sense if you note that the north is to the bottom right hand corner. Um, and there's uh, Broadball. So it had the same boundaries in 1623 as it's got now, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and, uh, but then it was called uh, Lower Sheepcock. And it was actually an arable field then, it was in cultivation. And here I've overlaid the uh, Ordnance Survey map um, showing the boundaries over the 1623 map. And you can see most, actually most of the farm has the same basic boundaries. Um, but the, uh, where the buildings are is, is still, um, it's, it's kind of open um, fields owned by individuals. Uh, and that continued uh, when um, Rothamsted was a research station in the 19th century. These were all allotments for people who worked on the estate. Uh, and um, it was allotments there until the 1960s, apparently. So the soil of uh, Rothamsted is a uh, backcomb series. Uh, so it's a fine silty clay um, over slowly permeable subsoil. And it all sits on top of, uh, of chalk, which is about, uh, well, it's about between one and a half and two meters down. Mm -hmm. um, what I noticed coming from Silso was the vast number of stones, and there's about 11% by volume, which doesn't sound that much, but actually, when you're trying to take samples, it's, it's a bit of a big deal, and it certainly stops you using the penetrometer and, and things like that. So, geology, it's, it's a plateau drift. Uh, and clay with flints. So the, the estate was owned by, well, uh, eventually it was owned by, in the mid 19th century by uh, Laws um, and uh, uh, so so it's John Bennett Laws. Um, and uh, he uh, partnered with Sir Henry Gilbert um, and they started, they were really interested in um, agricultural research and particularly the use of fertilizers. Uh, and they developed a fundamental understanding of plant nutrition and produced the world's first commercial chemical fertilizers. And it was uh, Laws Manures, which is quite a ring to it. Um, between 1836 and 42, they conducted pot trials and small scale field experiments. Uh, and were busy dissolving bones in sulfuric acid. So they must have been like the neighbors from hell, but there you go. Um, in 1842, Laws patented the superphosphate fertilizer and set up the factory at Deptford to manufacture and supply various fertilizers. And then he opened a second factory uh, in Barking Creek in, uh, in, on the River Thames. So moving on to 1872, he sold these companies, so quite a large amount of money and said he was going to devote his life to um, scientific, the scientific agriculture. Uh, and, <clears throat> and he put a lot of the money into trust and the fields uh, and, uh, and the <clears throat> land as well. Um, so he said he was going to do that in 1872, but he actually got around to doing it in 1889. So uh, much of the land is, is owned by the trust now, and that's why it's not been built on probably. So prior to the experiments, uh, the, the fields, well, particularly Broadport, was in a, a, a four course rotation. And the uh, four or five years prior to the experiment starting in 1843, it was in turnips, which had farmyard manure as a fertilizer. And then it went into the four course rotation which was uh, barley, peas, winter wheat, and oats. Uh, and uh, the last four crops were unmanured and uh, was regarded then um, as an exhausted land. So it was in, in its worst situation probably yeah. then. So sometime during the 18th century and uh, the 19th century, the field was chalked 
um, it's, a, it's quite a common uh, practice in this part of the world, or in that part of the world rather. Uh, they dig down two meters and they dig out the chalk uh, and they spread it over the surface. Um, and if I go back, you can see these guys, uh, they've obviously got a pit there and then they're spreading this chalk on the surface. And it was known to make a, a large improvement in soil workability as well as, as changing um, the pH. And the amount of effort they went to to do it, it must have made a big difference. So uh, the sites of these uh, pits, they kind of collapsed in on themselves. And, and over a period of time, they appeared as dells in the fields. And you can see these little craters around, around the farm. And then maybe five or six on Broadbalk of these dells where they've got the chalk out of. Uh, and these are actual chalk pits here in, in the woods. And there's more dells here as well. So you can see that quite easily on this LIDAR um, uh, scan. But when you're in the field, you're not necessarily aware of them unless they're some of the really big ones. So I mean, this, this, this one down here is quite big and you're kind of aware of that one. So the start of the wheat experiment started off with uh, 19 strips of uh, approximately 300 meters long, about six meters wide with a discard between. Uh, and you can see the dales marked out on here. Um, you can see the various dales marked here. Um, and I say over time, they, they haven't, I mean, it's not obvious when you're in the field that there, there is anything there. Um, and uh, the experiment was laid out in a systematic way with the farmyard manure on the, uh, on the left hand, on the, sorry, on the right hand side as we're looking at it. Uh, and then uh, zero nitrogen, then increasing mineral fertilizer, nitrogen should go here, and then mixtures of P and K should go across. So this was before randomization and uh, statistical design, and we'll come to that in a minute. So the findings in the first uh, 50 or so years uh, showed that uh, adding mineral fertilizer, you could increase your yield by a factor of three, um, similar to if you put large amounts of farmyard manure. And the, the amount of farmyard manure that they were putting on here was about 35 tons per hectare, which is around about uh, 200, sorry, about 280 um, kilograms of nitrogen typically although, of course, the manure is fairly variable. So these findings were really important, and they really helped lay the foundations of modern agriculture. Uh, and there was little government support in those days, but the farming community were so impressed that they raised more than a thousand pounds, which they presented to Laws, uh, and with which he built this testimonial laboratory, which was opened in 1855. And you can see the inside picture of it there. The, the samples are all sort of stored on the wall around the mezzanine floor. And the actual lab laboratory is in, in the bottom. So it looks quite an impressive place. So uh, if we see the changes in uh, yield over time, uh, we can see that uh, as we get to um, around about 19, 14, 1915, about the time of the First World War, there's this quite dramatic drop in yields. And this was as a result of the, uh, the plots being overwhelmed by uh, weeds. Um, prior to that, the uh, plots were hand, hand weeded uh, by men hoeing, uh, and local schoolgirls used to be employed to pull out the weeds between the rows because they were a bit more meticulous, although the man who was in charge of them uh, said that they laughed and joked about a lot, but in fact, they were obviously very good at the job. They were just having a good time, good for them. So as a result of this weed uh, problem, the uh, experiment was divided into five sections and they were followed on a rotational basis uh, once every five years to try and control weeds. Um, Broadport is slightly unusual for the times, and that it was a monoculture, it was continuous week after week after week, um, which is a little bit unusual, or very unusual, I think. Uh, and another problem that appeared between the walls all uh, was that the um, soil became quite acid. Uh, and so um, it, uh, from 1954, there was sort of regular liming 
started um, to bring the try and bring the pH up above six or around about six anyway, at least. So when we move on the next uh, 40 or 50 years, we see that we've recovered our, our um, yields as a result of uh, rotational um, furrowing. Uh, uh, and also the liming is, is, is helping as well. And um, as I say, we've still got a, a yield now of two to three times that if it's un, unmanured in any way. Uh, and the next big change came in the 1960s with the introduction of um, short um, straw wheat. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and you can see from the pictures on the left that the, the samples of wheat which were harvested um, in 1978, 1943, and 1993. Uh, and you can see the dramatic reduction in, uh, in, in straw length. And the major problem with the long straw wheat, which you, as you probably realize, is that as you put more nitrogen on, it has a tendency to fall over and, and you kind of lose your crop in that way. You've also got a lot of uh, the nutrient going into the straw, which you don't really want. So in 1968, the, the, major, the last really major changes, there was the introduction of the modern straw, short straw cultivars, uh, and it's divided into 10 sections. Uh, the, the field is divided into 10 sections now, and the introduction of a rotation in the experiment. And there's also a change from ammonia sulfate to calcium ammonium nitrate to try and stop the problem of acidity. Uh, and also, um, we took the opportunity to increase the amounts of nitrogen um, as a result of the short straw varieties. So in summary, we've got uh, the experiment started in 1943, fertilizer NPK, um, uh, sodium and magnesium and, and farmyard manure, mineral fertilizers uh, and nil were applied on these 20 strips in a systematic way. So between the two red lines here, the mineral fertilizers were applied. Um, farmyard manure and mineral fertilizer were applied on the, uh, the northern side of the field. And then there's a strip down the middle, uh, which don't get nothing, and then, and then you think since uh, 1843, since the experiment started. So we've got continuous wheat on uh, sections 0, 1, 6, 8, and 9. Uh, but we've now got a rotation on, uh, on the other plot, on the other sections. Uh, and th this rotation uh, was originally three wheats. I think uh, it was potato and uh, potatoes and oats, but that was changed partly for logistic reasons, but to um, three wheats, maize and oats. Uh, and now I think in the last year, they've changed it to three wheats, uh, oats and beans, um, but I, I'm, I'm not completely sure about that. that. That was what the plan was going to be anyway. So other th features of the experiment, section more has uh, straw, has had straw incorporated since uh, 1986, and section eight has never received any herbicides and still doesn't receive any herbicides. So that has to be followed on rotation, you know, once every five or six years. Um, at the top end of the field is a wilderness, and I'll talk about that a bit later on, uh, um, which is now sort of trees, uh, um, an area that's uh, mowed, not grazed, and an area where um, it's called stubbed. Basically, they take all the woody plants out. Um, and if you try and sample there, it's, it's basically stinging nettles, as far as I can tell. Um, section nine at the bottom, was redrained in 1993. Uh, the, ex the experiment was originally, or the field was originally drained uh, down to about 60 centimeters with um, uh, horseshoe shaped drains and tiles, um, but they seem to have stopped running. So in uh, 1993, they drew a, uh, a big drain across between uh, section eight and section nine and redrained uh, the, the last section nine into the, the drainage ditch so they could monitor the water outflow. So basically now we've got 188 subplots, very little or no replication uh, or, uh, and no randomization. Uh, and the site has been plowed annually 
And interestingly, it was originally ploughed partly by oxen. Uh, but in the memoirs of one of the guys that worked there, he said that the oxen would pull quite a large plough quite slowly. Um, but when they got bored, they just laid down. Um, so it was mainly ploughed by horses in the 19th and the early 20th century. And from 1919 onwards, it was ploughed by tractors. So now we've got the full um, yield uh, arrangement. And you can see that uh, with, um, with the advent of modern cultivars and the ability to put on more uh, um, fertilizer, we can uh, generate a lot more yield. But more importantly, uh, we can see that uh, where there's a rotation, the first wheat um, substantially out yields uh, the continuous wheat. Um, uh, and there's generally very little difference between uh, farmyard manure and mineral fertilizers. So that big increase in uh, yield there, I, I guess is what you call the green revolution. Along the bottom, you'll see that there are the different wheat varieties uh, shown there. So this is just a, a reiteration of what was shown there that the, uh, the continuous wheat is always out yielded by the first wheat in the rotation. Uh, and in this case, it's almost by a, a factor of two, not quite. Uh, and you can see the effect of adding farmyard manure as well. Also, as you get to the high yielding um, wheat, you can see that it, it, it becomes rather less resilient and requires more fungicides. So, or if it doesn't have fungicides, the, lead, the yield difference tends to increase. Similarly, so if we uh, look at the um, oops, one there. Uh, the losses of nitrate N into the drainage ditch, and this is just from the last um, section nine, you can see that uh, with increasing uh, nitrogen application, you get increasing losses. Uh, but the biggest losses are associated with uh, farmyard manure, partly because it's applied prior to ploughing, it's ploughed in uh, um, before the crop is, is, is grown and before the crop has a chance to attract, um, to um, uh, start to use any of the nitrogen. Interestingly, when they look back at the uh, records, they've got some drainage uh, work, uh, some drainage plots where they've set up. Um, we've been measuring the water coming out of the drainage. 120 year, years ago from identical treatments, uh, there was a 75, 74% great, the, the, the losses through the soil were 74% greater than today's. Um, and, it, and it's thought that that was partly due to the much larger yields now utilizing the, um, the nitrogen that's put on uh, and more efficient varieties uh, and better management practices. Now, now uh, all the nitrogen is put on in the spring in, in, in uh, several splits. Uh, as the plant grows. So from this, we can see that there's very little difference. In, well, the, there's no change where you're adding mineral fertilizers. There's very little difference in uh, soil organic carbon over a period of time. But when you add farmyard manure, there is a, an increase to uh, around about two and a half percent. But it tends to reach, it's, it's kind of reaching a sort of threshold really. So um, it reaches, it, it kind of reaches nearly the threshold after about 50 or 60 years or so. Um, so if you look at weeds now, if you remember I said section nine has never had any herbicides and you can see the effect of that. If you, we're stood at the bottom of the field now on the left-hand picture, looking up towards the farm. And you can see the section that's never had any herbicides. It's completely covered in weeds. Um, and uh, the pictures on the right are close-ups of uh, without herbicide and with herbicide. Um, and uh, um, the, the green strip you can see further up is probably the forage maize um, section. So over, over time, you can see the historical uh, effect of um, uh, the losses associated with 
um, uh, needs by comparing section eight and se section nine. So uh, as I say, before 1960s, or, um, there was no sort of chemical herbicide control at all. So there was a, just like a scatter of uh, yields of those particular plots. But uh, then you can see that the, the green line shows the yields that you get from um, when you apply the fertilizer, sorry, when you apply the herbicide. And the orange line represents the fertilizer, um, sorry, re represents the yield where you, where you sort of being, where your crop is competing with, uh, with the weeds. And if you look along the, you compare along the different treatments, you can see as you add more nitrogen, um, you, you get big differences between, uh, you can see there's quite a sharp increase in yield associated with um, uh, where, you, you know, where, you don't, where you control the weed. Interestingly, if you look at the zero um, nitrogen, um, then you can see that the weedy patch out yields the, um, the sprayed off patch. Uh, and I think that's probably because a lot of the weeds in there are, are leguminous. Um, so they're <laughs> applying a little bit of nitrogen there. So that, that, I mean, that's quite interesting. But the other thing to note is that uh, as, as you uh, increase the amount of nitrogen, it becomes, you know, it becomes much more difficult to, you know, the difference. You, you actually do need uh, mineral, sorry, you do need um, herbicides to, to control the weed because the, the Consequential differences, it gets bigger with more, um, with the application of more nitrogen. So, <clears throat> various um, uh, weed investigations have been conducted on Broadbrook, um, comparing uh, section eight with section nine over the last 170 years. And analysis of these species data revealed long-term trends in weed frequencies and, and population differences between the different plots. So some species like chickweed significantly refer, prefer um, the increased amounts of nitrogen fertilizer, whilst other weeds were strongly disadvantaged, um, like leguminous type weeds uh, and rare weeds such as corn buttercup. Uh, and field horsetail. Um, others weeds showed little response to nitrogen rates, and particularly black grasses and corn poppy just seem to be ubiquitous. They kind of were there all the time, uh, regardless of how much nitrogen you applied. And some of the black grass is now becoming a little bit resistant to herbicides as well. Finally, it's it note that Broadwalk experiment. <clears throat> is the home of the last occurring population of corn cleavers, um, which isn't common cleavers. It's apparently, it's an extremely rare plant nationally. And that's a picture of it. So it just looks like ordinary cleavers. So I'm, I'm guessing it might not be as rare as we think, but people just don't just think it's ordinary cleavers and pull it up. You kind of need botanists to find out where it is. So if we now move to mechanization, this picture by in the Borden building, which is where the conference room is, and it's by Harry Perry, and it was painted in the 1930s. And the top picture shows um, what she imagined it was like at Rothamsted uh, in the uh, in medieval times. And you can see there's oxen there playing with a with a plow. Um, and uh, more interestingly, is they seem to be breaking up clods with hammers, which is <laughs> a bit dodgy. Uh, and uh, the lower picture is an Austin tractor pulling a, uh, pulling a two furrow plow. And um, we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So I'm just going to talk briefly about, I guess, uh, one of my heroes, which is Bernard Keane, um, soil physics. And I would say he was an engineer as well, because he was finding fairly practical solutions um, from cutting edge science. So here's a picture of him. He's a bit of a dandy there in his flat and his um, plus falls. And he, uh, he made a, uh, a lightweight dynamometer, which effectively is a hydraulic link, which is, um, section, which is shown as A, and a recording device, uh, which was a, a moving tape, 
um, with a with a pen which was moved as the uh, as the um, Bowden tube moved backwards and forwards, and a control box with a Morse code um, tapping key for annotating the records. So it must have been quite complicated to operate. It must have been like flying a Harrier. There was so much stuff going on, um, and uh, and so then when they analysed all the tapes, they found. They were able to plot out this uh, this map of Bulbok here, and, and again, it's it's the, it, you recognise the uh, twenty or so strips, and the number of the plots are on the top. But interestingly, he's drawn uh, isodynes, as he calls them, which are lines of equal force, uh, and they range from about sixteen hundred pounds of pull up there near the top left-hand corner in plot seventeen. And then halfway down on the right hand side, it's about half of that 800 um, pounds of pull. Um, so this was one, it was in two years running. One year it was with a, a plow that was plowing about four and a half inches deep. And the next year it was with another plow plowing about five and a half inches deep. So he took a few uh, clay samples and he was able to show that clay was the principal factor affecting. Um, uh, the the draft force, but he was unable to pick up uh, cultural differences, i.e., the effect of different fertilizers and that. And we'll get onto that in a moment. Um, the other thing he did was uh, produce this uh, three dimensional model of the draft forces uh, out of plaster of Paris. Uh, I don't think it exists anymore, but it's quite a thing. So we're Suggesting this is the birth of precision agriculture in the 1920s. Haynes and Keane appear to have invented high resolution uh, digital soil sensing and mapping in the 1920s. Uh, they constructed the first on the go recording, soil recording sensor, uh, and made high resolution maps from uh, data points. Um, but the work was sort of not, was kind of lost really, and it soon as irrelevant. Um, until a, a new impetus of precision agriculture in the 1990s, when similar but independent work was evolved again. Uh, and this is a picture of the, uh, the different uh, tractors or the evolution of ploughing on the site over time. The bottom right hand corner is the oldest one, it's a Titan tractor, it's 20 horsepower and weighs three tons and it's generally considered to be too heavy. It managed to pull a three-furrow plow, um, and then they moved to the Austin tractor, which is the one above it, uh, which managed, to, which was um, one and a quarter tons, which I think is slightly lighter than my car, but it uh, <clears throat> pulled a two-furrow plow. Um, and the guy in the um, in the dark overcoat is uh, John Russell, who was a director at the time and, and wrote the book about. Um, soil and crop growth, which is still in, in print. Um, <clears throat> the top left-hand picture is a 1935 tractor ploughing, and, and then we move to the bottom left-hand corner, which is a 1955 tractor. And all these ploughs are one-way one ploughs, and they plough the field in a series of lands around the different plots. Um, the middle picture is a recent picture, uh, and uh, that's uh, a reversal plough, and we now plough at nine inches, uh, deep, but there's a tendency for it sometimes to go slightly deeper because I've seen some subsoil being brought to the surface. I think as we've got more and more power, there's a difficulty sometimes keeping the plough as, as shallow. The furrow width is still, so the plough is a cavernal plough and it's closed right, closed right down to six inch furrow width, but the mobiles are much bigger than in the 20s and 30s and even the 50s. Um, so there's a tendency, although the, the furrow width is the same width, um, it's throwing the soil further because uh, it's making a, a wider open furrow for the wider tyres. So I did some measurements on this back in 2000. So we used um, kind of better sense. We used the Schultz linkage. We use laser proximity sensors to measure the front furrow width and the depth. And we measured uh, Doppler radar speed sensors. Uh, and from that, we measured draft force power and all sorts of other things as well. Um, 
And uh, we also measured the organic carbon on, on the, across the site. Uh, and uh, you can see it ranges from about 0.7 um, uh, percent carbon up to three and a half percent carbon. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see the high levels of carbon only occur where farmyard manure has been applied for, um, you know, for 170 plus years. Um, the rest of the field is, is fairly low carbon, basically between less than one and a half percent. But there is a sort of a, a hint of an intermediate value on uh, section zero, where straw has been incorporated. Also, the, the soil up there is slightly heavier. And also where uh, there's no herbicide been applied. So basically, you tend to be plowing in large amounts of green manure down there. So I also measured the clay on about 200 of the plots, clay content. Um, it would surprise me that nobody had really measured it in any, in any systematic way before. So that ranges from about 38% uh, up at the top of the field, top left-hand corner of the field, um, with slightly higher values down through the middle, and very low values of clay down the right-hand side, uh, which happens to be where the farmyard manure is applied. So my draft measurements, agreed fairly well with uh, Keenan Haynes. So there's a, the, the higher draft bit in the middle, although mine is specific draft here, I've divided by the cross-section area to get a soil strength measurement. Um, and uh, so the top left-hand corner is the high draft in the middle, uh, I'd say it's also high specific draft, but where farmyard manure's been applied um, is, is, is much lower draft but that's not necessarily because of the farmyard manure. Uh, and if we move on to this, if we prop clay against um, specific draft or soil strength, we can see that there's a fairly good relationship between clay content and draft, specific draft. And the dark spots represent the uh, farmyard manure um, application, you know, the plots where farmyard manure has been applied. And you can see that they're all, all at the low clay end uh, but they all tend to be below the uh, below the um, uh, below the line. So there probably is an effect of, of uh, or we believe there is an effect of farmyard manure on in reducing draft. So if we use some we use some sort of more up to date statistics. Well, they didn't have any statistics that they used in those in the nineteen twenties. So if we, we can see here, the, the green histogram shows the differences in organic carbon associated with um, different fertilizer treatments. And you can see again that the, where there's uh, mineral fertilizers, there's not a large difference between them. And the, um, uh, but where there's farmyard manure, you can see there's a big increase up to nearly 3%. Um, you can see the effect of yield of adding fertilizer, and that's the red axis on the right hand side and the red line. But you can see the effect of uh, on draft force. So the mineral fertilizer, although it's have a major effect on, um, uh, on uh, organic carbon, it does have a major effect on uh, plow draft. So bigger crops mean in this situation lower draft. So the specific draft uh, increased with clay, but decreased with additions of farmyard manure. And that kind of, um, the clay part of it confirms what Haynes and Keane said, but the farmyard manure bit is, well, they, they thought that there was a difference in farmyard manure as well, but they weren't sure about it. Increasing applications of mineral nitrogen resulted in relatively small increases in soil organic carbon, but large reduction in specific draft. So that's our new more sensitive sensors and modern statistics. Uh, and something a bit different for us is that the minimum soil organic carbon values increase with increasing clay content, suggesting that clay is stabilizing the uh, soil organic carbon. So if we move briefly on to harvesting, this is a picture taken in 1880. And you can see they were harvesting the field then with sickles um, so there's plenty of scope for agricultural engineering to improve this, which must have been a pretty laborious uh, and labor intensive work. Uh, and this is an aerial photo, the first aerial photograph taken at Roth Rothamsted in 1925 by a guy leaning out of a biplane, apparently, with a camera. 
Uh, and you can see the uh, sheaves there um, all stacked up all along the different plots uh, and being collected in. Uh, and the plots on the left hand side are yet to be harvested. The sharp nest sickles. Uh, and then it was uh, um, <clears throat> put in the thrashing machine and the grain was uh, separated from the straw. Samples were weighed of both for each plot. Um, uh, and uh, samples were also stored in the archive. Uh, and then in 1935, uh, they were using binders. Um, this is uh, probably using binders before 1935, but, but this is, is a picture taken in 1935 with a horse drawn binder. And there's another picture taken the same year with, um, uh, with a tractor pulling the binder. So moving on to 1950s, uh, we have the bagger combine there. So uh, they're going through the plots, cutting and uh, collecting the, the, the sample um, into, into bags. And they're also got about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight people there collecting the straw to be weighed as well. So that was also quite labor intensive. Another picture in the 1970s, and there's two combines here, the pale yellow Clayton combine is another bagger combine. So people are collecting samples and bagging them up there to be weighed. Um, and the near combine, they seem to be collecting straw or, or stuff out the back. And this is a picture on Who's Barley, which is another of the um, long-term experiments from the mid 19th century. So coming up to the, um, uh, the 21st century, we start to use um, uh, plot combines, which are able to weigh and also, in theory, measure the moisture content of the grain as it comes off uh, and either chop or weigh the straw. And now Rotham said of five of these uh, plot combines, these uh, pull drop combines, uh, which are very sophisticated uh, and uh, weigh the sample as it comes off, takes a subsample and bags it up for you. Uh, and uh, also either chops or, or can weigh the straw as well. Uh, it can also measure the moisture content, um, but um, Rotham did still take off a sample and, and measure the moisture some, uh, uh, content in the traditional way. I think, um, the Rotham still have got three of these combines now, and I think they're, they're quite expensive, but now they have got typically between 10 and 15,000 plots to measure. Um, each year, so uh, they pretty full on when it's harvest time. So this was something I, <clears throat> I got to help the farm out with, but we needed it for all sorts of other reasons as well. So uh, we managed to get the um, about 18,000 pounds required for this survey equipment so we can mark out the fields. So basically we'll mark out the fields uh, in, in the farm, and then we can just go out and the thing will allow one person to be able to mark, uh, mark out the plots. And this was accurate to within um, a couple of centimetres or so. Um, and it's a huge time saving because previously they were also having to dig down to find where the buried marker posts were below the, the depth of, uh, of ploughing and find those and start from there with tape measures and all sorts of other things to set it up. Although fertilizers are supplied with, um, um, with uh, you know, um, satellite navigation system on the tractors, um, it's still necessary to mark the plots out precisely. So we're also using, we're moving to using UAV sent um, and uh, on, on the Rothamsted one, it's a, an octocopter. Uh, whoops, let's get that one. So the red bunny, it's got three, a number of sensors on it, but the ones that were on it when I was there was a red, blue, green camera. Uh, and this shows uh, crop growth, uh, can, ground cover, and it can work out crop height. And uh, it's used with other images to calculate NDVI. Uh, and it also may show up disease. Uh, it's a thermal imager which shows also shows crop growth, but also shows uh, if there's drought stress uh, and also may show disease. Uh, and the near infrared imager uh, is able to uh, estimate crop growth as well uh, and can also indicate um, disease. 
So <clears throat> using all this information now, uh, which is, is sort of kind of tagged spatially, we can go through um, soil type, which has been mapped, um, canopy temperature. We can use remote sensing soil um, electromagnetic imaging. Uh, we can look at historical yields. Uh, we can look at the variation in soil type. We can look at the different amounts of nitrogen applied, NDVA, and all sorts of other bits and pieces, which I don't really know much about. And you could overlay that on the experimental uh, plan. Uh, uh, and then from that, you can extract the, the data that you're looking for. Uh, um, and this leads to better interpretation. It also allows much more frequent sampling through the growing season. We do have a little bit of a problem at Rothamsted because we're in the air traffic control area of Luton Airport. But as uh, the drone is only supposed to go up to uh, 400 feet high, I think if, if there's a 737 coming in at 400 feet over Rothamsted, it's, um, I think the drone's the least of their problems. So Rothamsted is a home of modern statistical analysis and experimental design. Uh, and it was actually the first, uh, first non-military place to have a computer. And you can see the computer, an Elliott computer in the, in the middle. Um, Fisher uh, was the statistician who came, uh, was, came in, the, uh, 1920, in the 1920s, I think it was. And uh, he was given 70 years of uh, broad book um, results to analyze. Uh, and he made them by him by uh, the brass looking uh, calculator thing on the left hand side, which is called a millionaire. But as we've moved on over time, now we're all using laptops and uh, Genstat is, is um, a window, you know, you can use Genstat on Windows based equipment now. So um, we're still using lots of statisticians to help us with our analysis. Um, but there's a spin off company which has um, uh, generated the Genstat software. Uh, which is still partly owned by uh, Rothamsted. So I imagine that's quite a money spinner. So we also collect and archive samples. So you can see here people sorting botanical samples. Uh, this is in the, uh, in the lab I was telling you about. You can see all the samples up there on the wall, uh, a nice big heater there. And it's good to see that the table is held up by two great big drain pipes. Uh, and that's picture in the 1930s, uh, and there's uh, girls working on the, and uh, looking at the, the different botanical samples. Uh, uh, and the, the lady who stood up there is, uh, I think it was Catherine Bletch, Blenchley, who was the head of the botanical department at, at Rothamsted in the, uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and it <clears throat> still goes on today. This is actually grass sample from park grass, but the, the same applies for weeds and other um, things that grow on broad ball. So we've got soil sampling, uh, and you can see um, the, I think that's Mr. Keen again, or Dr. Keen again, and his box. And if you look at that great big concrete hammer on a stick, um, you can see that it was pretty hard going to knock these boxes in to get density uh, samples. Uh, especially when they're going down to quite a depth. Uh, <clears throat> 1943, they look like they're having a bit of a laugh or they've lost something. Uh, and uh, the picture, the contemporary picture in the middle there shows one of my colleagues there taking an auger sample. But it's interesting to note that he's got a wartime dried milk tin that he's put his samples in, so nothing ever gets thrown away at Gotham Stick. And there's a picture of the new archive down there on the right hand side. So the new archive is uh, was moved into, I think, in about 90, sorry, in about 2016, 2017. Uh, it comprises more than 300,000 grain and straws and herbage soil and fertilizer samples and manure samples as well, dating back to 1843. So it's it's a real treasure trove. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't know what they were thinking when they um, started 
saving all these samples, but they couldn't have done what the myriad of things that they were all going to be used for over the coming few centuries. Uh, and I think uh, Laws recognised that. Uh, um, and he, he was just realising that there were a lot of modern uh, chemical techniques which were, which were um, still being used, which were being developed and, and he, I guess that's why he was keeping samples back to um, to be you know archiving the samples so um, the electronic all this stuff is is stored on the electronic Rothamsted archive um, so that is all the results and stuff associated with the uh, broadboard park grass foodsfield barley wilderness alternate wheat uh, and fallow and woven lay arable experiments and that's uh, a sale data on um, yields, crop, nutrients, um, species, and etc. Also, all the weather data is co collect on there. Uh, all sorts of background information, documents, and lots of the photographs I've got from here, from were on the archive. Um, there's a comprehensive bibli bibliography, and uh, the long-term experiments have generated 70, 1,700 papers over the last uh, 180 years. Uh, and the electronic archive is is open to anybody to use. You just have to register to, to use it, and then you can download the um, some of the data. So some of the uh, <coughs> recent uses of the uh, samples taken out of the archive are basically pollution studies and uranium and plutonium. They're able to go back and see the spikes in in these. As a result of uh, nuclear tests, you know, when they were doing atmospheric nuclear testing in the 50s, 50s and early 60s, you can see changes in the amount of sulfur, which is uh, on on uh, different amounts on different forage forages, uh, as a result of things like the brickworks and and uh, industry like that, uh, and all sorts of other pollutants uh, can be. Um, tracked through time using these uh, looking in, in detail at these samples. We also can go back and look at changes in organic carbon, uh, um, and, it's, and this has been partly used to look at the Roth, to validate the Roth C model, uh, describing the turnover of organic matter. Uh, and this has now been extended to include subsoil carbon. Uh, and probably a, a major interest is the extraction of DNA from plant material. And you can look at the evolution of fungal pathogens and soil bacteria. So weather and climate. So the picture on the left is Rothamsted in 1947, which I'm told was a pretty cold year. And a rather pessimistic picture on the right is uh, possibly what 2047 will be like, but I think that is a little bit pessimistic. And so we've got an increasing concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide, and this is this is the um, you can see it's it's basically increased from about. 300 parts per million to more than 400 parts per million over the last uh, 50 or 60 years. So we've been monitoring weather at Rothamsted for, for, for many years uh, uh, and increasing amounts of detail and also increasing frequency. Some of it is now recorded on an hourly basis. So this is a picture of the original setup, which had um, uh, various sizes of rain gauge including a large one, which was a thousandth of an acre. Um, <clears throat> and they started measuring rainfall in 1853. And, in, and you can see on that table down on the left, the different things that have been added as we've been able to do it. And the tower you can see is measuring wind speed. It's uh, 10 meters and that was uh, 1960. So over time, we can see that uh, Temperature remains fairly constant at Rothamsted, typically around about nine degrees. Uh, this is average temperature through the year. Um, the occasional, uh, well, three occasions when it went above uh, 10 degrees. Um, um, but then if we add the uh, last 10 or 20 years, we can see that over the last, um, of the 24 Hosses years on record, 21 have occurred in the last 30 years. So there's definitely a change in temperature. Um, we can also see that if we look at the minimum temperatures in February, 
and these recordings began in 1878. Uh, um, you can see that there, there's quite a few major frosts uh, during February uh, in the sort of 19th and 20th century. But um, <clears throat> in recent years, we don't seem to get as many frosts. And the dotted line shows the, the sort of change in minimum, temp minimum February temperatures. And you can see there's a progressive increase. So climate change and weak yield predictions. So, so there was a, if you remember about five or six years ago, maybe a bit longer, the UK climate change risk assessment predicted that there would be a 40 to 140% increase in wheat yield by 2050 based on a simple regression model linking yield changes with uh, temperature increase. Uh, but that kind of rattled the cages big time at Rothamsted. And so they used broadboard data to demonstrate that uh, this analysis was a bit, um, well, had major shortcomings, put it politely. Uh, and that the increase wasn't necessarily due to changes in temperature, but was more due to increases in fertilizer, uh, the um, use of uh, dwarf wheat varieties, better pest con and disease control. Um, uh, and the modelers at Rothamsted seem to think that uh, for every degree rise in uh, temperature, um, there will be a 6% reduction in yield. Um, so a bit different from the big increase that they were looking for. Increases in carbon dioxide should also lead to an increase in, um, uh, in, in wheat yields. But in reality, that doesn't seem to show up at all. So weather patterns are, are probably more useful than climate change. And somebody, um, um, has had a look at the different weather patterns that we've had over the last 180 odd years. And so they've basically taken mon uh, monthly summaries of temperature, rainfall, sunshine, and they've identified 10 distinct clusters of yearly weather patterns that occurred from 1892 to 2016. Um, so the annual weather cluster that is most dominant since 1991 generally had higher summer temperatures, higher than average summer temperatures, and more intense winter rainfall. Um, but they tended to have dry, drier than average dunes. And this weather pattern is associated with uh, reduction, with associated with lower cereal ye yields. The three clusters, which are cold winter uh, and an early cold, cold winter and a cold spring, early spring, and a cold August to September, and cooler dry March uh, were contained in 64% of the years uh, up to um, and, well, during the 20th century. Whilst this cluster with high temperatures and a dry June was contained in 63% of the samples taken in the 21st century. So it's changes in temperature, it's changes in uh, rainfall, but it's changes in weather patterns as well. So a little bit now on the Broadbolt Wilderness. Uh, this kind of occurred in 1882. This was one of these ideas that you could have then, but, uh, but you can't really do now, probably. Um, Laws decided, he wondered what would happen if he just left the wheat in the field, at the top of the field, unharvested. He wondered how it would do regenerating itself. Uh, and the picture on the left shows what happened after four years. So it was kind of out competed by weeds. And it basically disappeared and you hardly recognised it as wheat at all. But anyway, he didn't give up on that. He let the area, he just left it largely untouched since then. And it's now known as the Broadbolt Wilderness. And it contains mainly ash uh, and sycamore and hawthorn. And because it was chalked in the uh, 18th, 19th century, its pH is still above seven. And if we look at the, the figure on the left, you can see that uh, um, the, there's an increase in both soil organic carbon, but the major increase is in the carbon within the trees. Uh, and um, because I haven't got two screens now, I can't see what the, uh, what the difference is. But in fact, it's, uh, I can, sorry, I can't put a figure on it. 
Um, but <clears throat> basically, most of the increase in carbon is in the wood of the tree. So if you chop the trees down and burn them, it doesn't really gain very much. But the other thing of interest is that even after um, more than 100 years, the, uh, these carbon values seem to be increasing over time. There is another wilderness in Rothamsted, uh, Jeescroft, which is about a kilometre away. And this field was never chalked. And so the pH on that, um, where, where those uh, trees are, um, has gone from about uh, seven down to about four and a half. The trees there are different sorts. They're basically oak and holly. And the amount of carbon there put in the soil and also the amount of carbon in the wood there is about half of what it is here on, uh, on the Broadport wilderness. Also looking at the effect of you know whether you can uh, how rapidly you can change the organic carbon in the soil um, by adding farmyard manure you can see that initially there's a quite a sharp rise in organic carbon but it reaches a plateau after about uh, 20 no more than that, uh, 40 or 50 years or so, uh, and then kind of levels out. And you kind of need to keep adding that amount of manure to keep it at that level anyway. So this is the, the reason for this is, is now be, the reason this has become relevant now is that uh, people are looking to mitigate climate change through agricultural management. And the questions that they're asking is, can we store more carbon in agricultural soils? Um, uh, and the amount of carbon in the soil is influenced predominantly by farming practice, but also climate and weather and soil type. So the answer to the first question is possibly, but usually it's the cost of reducing the area of land which we grow food, i.e. if you grow woodland or if you grow forest, then, um, then that's, uh, you know, that's not producing food. Uh, and these, uh, these increases are only possible uh, until a new equilibrium value is reached. And that tends to can be determined by these long-term experiments. And you can see that uh, the effect of adding large amounts of farmyard manure shows that you're, you know, you do lead to an increase in uh, organic carbon in the short term, but then you, reach, you end up reaching a new equilibrium. So probably better solutions are to reduce the amount of deforestation and cut down the number of um, oil palm plantations uh, or reduce the number of oil palm plantations. But I've worked with several Brazilian people, I think, and they're not, they kind of think that we've chopped down all our forests and why shouldn't they chop down all theirs? Well, they did think that, but I don't think they think that anymore. So the other thing is, can we continue to maintain and increase yields? You may remember that we were on a 2020 wheat thing some years ago, about 10 years ago, and we're getting pretty close to it, I think. But as you've seen earlier on, we can, as, as you get higher and higher yields, you need to put more and more inputs in to protect them. They're more, they seem to be much more vulnerable to weeds and um, diseases and all sorts of other things. So the answer to that is possibly, but it's not easy. So we can keep introducing higher yielding cultivars, um, but we can also look to more efficient use of nitrogen both, uh, from both fertilizer and manures uh, and attempt to decrease gaseous and leaching losses. But in, in, in real terms, it's probably not enough to feed an increasing population without uh, everybody going through a major change in diet. So if we just Towards the end now, we just look at the social side of, uh, um, of, of uh, these long-term experiments. So the Broadbolt experiment has continued through two world wars. Um, uh, and in both wars, modern agricultural practice was a key to increasing homegrown food supplies. So um, immediately after the wars, there was, there was a big increase in spending on agricultural research. Um, this is an interesting fact, I don't know if any of you knew this, but on the September the 2nd, 3rd, 1916, a Zeppelin flew over and dropped a bomb on uh, Broadport, uh, on plot zip towards the farm, it left a 11 foot deep crater, which obviously filled in and, and they fished all the uh, wheat sheaves out. 
uh, and rescued them. Um, but it didn't really say a lot of detail about it. But that same night, a Zeppelin was shot down over Cuffley, just a few miles south of here. So he probably was, um, wasn't was aiming it broadboard. He was probably just trying to get shot of some weight. So uh, Rotham said Bannon was used as a secret signals and code breaking as part of a code breaking unit at Bletchley Park. Uh, and it was uh, one of the locations for, of Alan Turing's early machines. And in that picture, which was taken in 1943, you can see some of the 100 foot aerials which were put up in all the surrounding fields. Uh, and wartime restrictions meant it was difficult to get the appropriate containers for soil and crop samples. So you can see that we, they were um, very good and used powdered milk tins and all sorts of other things. So it's almost like a museum of packaging now as well. So all sorts of different containers during the war uh, years were used. So here is heroes and villains. So obviously the major heroes or uh, were obviously Laws and Gilbert who, who set it up and ran it. So Laws was the um, when they, they collaborated for more than 50 years, actually. Um, and it was partnership of contrast. Laws was the ideas man, while well, Gilbert provided scientific rigor. Laws ran his factory business uh, most of the time and paid for all the experimental work. And Gilbert ran the experiments uh, on the estate uh, on, at Rothamsted. So that's some heroes. John Russell uh, is a wrote a book that is sitting on my shelf behind me, um, uh, Soil and Crop Growth, uh, but he was also, um, he ended up creating a very modern institute at uh, Rothamsted. He, he took, he employed lots of uh, scientists who weren't anything to do with agriculture, uh, uh, and in the end, he ended up with uh, 12 scientists with uh, FRSs uh, on, on his staff. Uh, and some amazing work was done in the interwar years. And I'll say Bernard Keane, we've already spoken about, uh, he was a soil physicist and engineer, uh, uh, and uh, he did some really interesting work on soil physics. Also pioneers of the study of physics, um, study of physics and biology, and rapid transpiration. Most of us have heard of uh, Pedman and Monteith, they both worked at Rothamsted. They were both employed there in the sort of fifties uh, and sixties. Ronald Fischel, who was uh, considered as one of the top ten scientists of uh, the twentieth century, he was the founding father of uh, field experimental design and, and statistics in general, and came up with things like the Latin square F test, correlation coefficients, analysis of variance. Uh, and Frank Yates was also a statistician and he inaugurated the era of statistical computing. You can see him there with the old millionaire calculator. Um, and uh, that's eventually led on over a period of time into the development of uh, GenStat, which is now, um, as I say, was run off, run as a spin off company. Uh, but moving towards the villain, Fisher's uh, promotion of eugenics. <laughs> has recently caused various organizations to remove his name from awards and dedications and buildings uh, and, and names of buildings. Uh, and that includes at Rothamsted. So what was the Fisher Court building is now the ANOVA Court building. I'm not too sure what I think about that. I, um, I mean, it's some pretty dodgy ideas, but it didn't come to anything. Um, and if we're all condemned on the worst things we did, we would, um, yeah, we'd all be in the stew a bit. Anyway, women and children. A uh, hundred years ago, in, in the 1920s, more than a third of Rothamsted's workforce were women, and that included Winifred Bletchley here, who was, um, oh, sorry, Bletchley. She, she was uh, head of the botany department and, and Britain's leading authority on weeds. And another one was Mary Glynn at the same time. She was a plant pathologist and renowned mountaineer. And today, approximately half the staff, I think it's more than half the staff actually are women, including the director and chief executive, Angela Carr, who's actually quite a nice person to work for. So children, um, I didn't have any picture of children in the 19th century, but I know that they did work on, uh, on weeding of Broadbalk. As I said, uh, they, 
um, laws employed um, a gang of girls to weed within the roads while the men were doing the hoeing. Um, and uh, I don't think he paid them that much, but what he did do was he, at the end of the season, he had a big party and he built them all party dresses to go to, which is um, probably a bit unacceptable in today's terms, but um, yeah. And here's a picture, I think, I don't know if this is pre-war or immediately after the war. This is uh, uh, lots of boys picking up potatoes off of the fields at, at, um, at Rothamsted. So in conclusion, I guess it's a testament to the foresight and commitment of John Laws and Henry Gilbert, as well as others that have come after them, that Broadbolt Field experiment established 170 years ago continues to re reveal new insights and important findings of relevance to today's agriculture and its interactions with our ever-changing environment. Thank you so much, Chris. That was amazing. Wow. <laughs> what a, a, a run through. Fantastic history. Just extraordinary. And the photos and the illustrations that you had are just beautiful. Fantastic. So thank you very much. Um, we do have some questions, so um, I'll ask the ones that are in the chat if that's okay. Okay. Um, if you uh, bear with me a second, let's get these up. So um, Tim Chayman uh, came in first saying, uh, was talking about the plots when you were talking about the plots. Does plot eight have to be fallowed because of weeds or diseases or both? If weeds, might there be potential for weeding these plots in the future with a robot? Yeah, um, it, it, it's, it is, it is followed because of weeds. Um, it's, uh, and it's typically five years, every five years or so, sometimes it's a little bit longer. Uh, and about three years ago, they followed it for two years. So I think, I think there were some pretty pernicious weeds then. Um, and uh, I think yeah, I, I think probably one of the other sections might be better suited for um, replacing, uh, um, you know, re replacing um, herbicides with a, a robot. Because I think there's a long, uh, I think lots of people at Rothamsted are really interested in the, um, how how weeds and crop interact with each other uh, and the weed populations associated with different uh, things so in some ways they don't really want to get rid of the weeds there they want to see what happens if you are stuck with weeds there if that makes sense um, so the weeds is something that they're quite interested in yeah okay thanks chris and then next question comes from James. James Green uh, was asking about the, the steep drop off in, in both yields around 2000. Um, that, would, that referred to one of your earlier slides, which showed crop yields. Um, yeah, I, th I think some of the, uh, yeah, some of the yield drop off were um, kind of disease related to, to different wheat varieties, um, I think some of that was a problem. Also, uh, differences in, uh, in, in, in season, which can cause a, 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 a big drop off. But the, if that was the one with the weed showing, the big drop off there was, um, I, I think because you're only looking at a single plot there, um, uh, you're comparing plots with, with plots rather than the, you know, the, whole, the whole strip. Um, and I know in the last uh, five or six years, um, <clears throat> they've actually failed to achieve getting a crop in before the new year, um, partly because of a very wet autumn, um, but uh, lack of labour is a bit of a problem. And also, I think that's one of the reasons they've gone away from uh, forage maize, because they were always hanging on to, um, until they... Were, you know, until they were ready to cut the forage maize, uh, or so it seemed to be more of a logistics problem than, than um, you know, which is why that they um, they didn't actually achieve planting the crop in the uh, um, in the autumn. It actually moves just over into the spring. So yeah, I'm I'm not really sure exactly what the reason is for those. Yeah, I'm just guessing at the moment. 
Um, the next question is again from Tim. So uh, do you think the lower draft requirement of higher yielding crops due to nitrogen alone is caused by additional root volume? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, I think uh, what we what we've seen is that uh, the soil adjacent to the roots is, is very different to the, to the soil that's the, the bulk soil, if you like, um, and, and it tends to be more friable. Um, so the interesting thing, and uh, this soil does shrink and swell a little bit, not as much as say boot field, which Tim knows really well. Um, uh, so it, I think this wetting and drying is, is generating sort of kind of micro cracks and the soil is, is, is slightly more friable, but uh, there's very little difference in organic matter between, you know, between the different mineral fertilizers. But um, some of the people at Rothamsted are thinking that very small changes in organic carbon can result in very big changes in uh, in aggregate strength and aggregate stability. Um, and it's more to do with the location and, and as you say, the action of the action of roots. All right, all right. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Okay. And then, uh, the final one in the chat is a cheeky one from Alan Plum um, uh, to Dick, actually, to Dick Goldwyn. So Dick, do you envisage that your traction and tillage projects at half are going on as long as board Broadwalk Board. Of course, why wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, without, well, uh, without ambition, what can we do, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently you're in the fourth DBT funded PhD and, and you've got another 55 to go. That's, that's, not, that's not bad. I mean, it's, it's interesting that I, I often refer to the, the, the plots at, at Harper as tomorrow plots because the second experimental layout, like Broadboard was the Morrow plots in Illinois, which I walked <laughs> by every day for two years. And so, uh, if we could extend it and get the right funding, so as long as DBT's got endless pockets and we all put our pension pots into it, we should be all right for the next 150 years. Are you finding lots of new things to measure and lots of interesting differences over time? Yes, we are. Uh, very, very much. We, you were talking about uh, yield with no till against till, certainly. Yes. Our, our yields were down in the early times, um, but after six years, they were they were becoming equal. And in the seventh and eighth year, no-till was outperforming um, the uh, the deep the, the standard deep tillage treatments. And having looking at the economics alongside it, even in the early years, comes back to Jane's comment about profit. Um, that certainly the the reduction in establishment costs. Out, outweighed the losses uh, due to yield. Yeah, that, that was a lesson we learned in the 1970s, uh, Dick. Exactly. The, the yield was king. Uh, yeah. You just could not afford to lose any any amount of uh, yield. No, no, the, no, that's the no. The contrary to that, Tim, what we were finding in the early part was that the that you could use lose yield, but you could compensate that. Oh right, by sorry, the, sorry, misunderstood that. Sorry. By yeah. the by the reduction by the reduction in establishment costs. It depends on how you do your economics. Um, but that, the, the massive increase in fertilizer prices now means that I think your optimum fertilizer, you know, you, you've got a, a, a peak for yield, but you need to be a long way back off of that peak because of your, as you say, your financial sustainability. Yeah. Um, you know, you, 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 um, one of the good things that uh, our previous director did was he, he set up an um, agronomy competition where you had to have little teams of three or four people that you could get together and you had to grow a crop of wheat. Uh, he was basically trying to get the um, geneticists out into the field. That's what it boiled down to. <laughs> so I set up this experiment where we had four plots each randomly arranged in blocks and what have you. Um, and we could choose our own wheat variety and we could choose how much fertilizer we put on and um, uh, you know whether we sprayed it and all sorts of other things uh, which was a really interesting exercise actually having to do it yourself and um, what happened was that uh, we didn't win with the maximum yield um, the farm did that because they just chucked on shed loads of um, 
um, um, fertilizer and, and got really big yields. But we got the cut for the highest gross margin because we were a bit more thoughtful about what we did. We also cheated a little bit by using hybrid wheat, which actually um, uh, kind of out yielded the others and, and was ready. I, I, we would have probably went on yield as well with hybrid wheat if um, uh, if we were um, able to harvest ours at, when it was ready. And ours, because ours was ready about three weeks before everybody else's. Um, do we have any more questions for Chris from the from the gallery? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks from me, Jane, um, to to Chris. Um, fantastic talk, Chris. Really interesting, all the history and yeah, stuff I just didn't know about. So uh, yeah, well done. Yeah, I second that. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. very very good. It's Excellent. Was, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. But I think, as I say, the scientists always jump up and down in their green revolution and always cutting edge science. But I think in, you know, looking at those guys cutting the field with sickles, um, you know, it, I mean, that's an extreme case. But, uh, you know, what engineers have done and what they are still doing, you know, moving on to doing all these measurements with, with drones and remote sensing and all the other things. Um, it, uh, you know, I think we're playing at as big, if not a bigger part, uh, as they are. And that's what I kind of hope to bring out in the middle of the talk, really. I don't know whether you know, Chris, but John Shuler in Florida wrote a piece, I think, from the Ameri American Society of Mechanical Engineers when they were looking for what was the greatest invention of the last hundred years. And agricultural mechanization came number two or number three. Uh, on the on the on the list because it basically freed people's minds to go off and do other things uh, rather than be the, dr the you know, a, a drudgery type operation of working in the fields. Mm -hmm. So not only did it feed the world, but it also included everything else to be developed as a result of taking labour out of the fields. Yeah, yeah, you know, I can believe that, and, and I'm I'm glad it was so high up the list. Yeah, I'll try and I've got a piece of paper with it on. I'll try and find it and send it to you. Super, thanks, Dick. Appreciate that. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Chris. That was really fascinating, yes. really, really interesting. And, uh, you know, every time I, I read about Rothamsted, hear about Rothamsted, there's always something new going on. But also seeing the history, what has gone on before, I think we must always remember that and uh, see what trajectory we've made. So thank you so much, Chris. And before we end, I'll just give a bit of an advert because I think I'm meant to be doing this um, for our next speaker, uh, which will be on January the 12th, I believe, at 7.30. Uh, and the speaker is James Lowenberg de Boer, who will be talking about adoption pathways for autonomous crop equipment. So um, I believe that's the right date. I'm sure um, we'll get a confirmation from Sarah from HQ as to uh, the date and the time. And indeed the location, I think it will be via Zoom because um, we've been thrown out for bad behavior at the George. I, I think I think also talking, I was talking via uh, Skype to James this morning. He's, at, he's in Purdue at the moment. And I don't think he was expecting to come back until the weather got a little bit nicer. Yeah, sure. Okay, very good. Right, well, that leaves me only to wrap up this evening's uh, proceedings. Chris, thank you very much again. Thanks to everybody for coming as well and um, enjoy the rest of your evenings and um, hopefully we will meet up again in the new year. And am I allowed to say Merry Christmas to everybody? We are December, so it's all right, isn't it? We're allowed to say that. No, we won't say bar humbug, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> you surprised me, Dick. <laughs> Very good. Lovely to see everybody. And uh, thanks again for, for turning up and um, see you again all soon.